for authors, filmmakers, entertainment, and all your listening needs. Listen now to Talk Now Radio, where no topic is taboo. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talk Now Radio. This is your host, Royce the Redneck Radio Man. Uh, we were supposed to be joined by Geraldine uh, Palmer today. However, she was not quite able to make it, and we're going to reschedule her for later. And in the meantime, I've got a friend of hers and a co-worker, you might call her a uh, a co-associate. I'm not sure how they would term this, uh, Marsha Becker with me, who's going to discuss their radio show. You might call them co-hosts. And she's going to discuss a little bit about uh, true... Well, I don't have the book right in front of me. Let me reach behind me and get it. True Hunting, which is her husband's book, and her husband's Edwin F. Becker. And I just started reading this last night, folks. I'm going to have it finished in time for my interview with Ed, which is coming up in October over at uh, freedomslips.com. But this is going to give you all kind of like a pre-treat into this here. And uh, y'all have a chance to get your appetites wetted for the next show and for the book itself. So, Marsha, how are you doing today? I'm doing just fine. How are you? Oh, I'm doing just great. Uh, you know, getting by the day-to-day like we always do and getting wet in this weather. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's hot and humid here, too, and it's oh, miserable. I'm ready for fall. Come on, bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> I am, too. In fact, this time of year is really hard on my lungs, so I'm extra oh, yes. ready for fall. <laughs> I get you. I really do. Now, yes, have you noticed the weird weather? Feels... Pardon me? Have you noticed the weird weather? I mean, it's been awful wet. I mean, usually it's by the uh, middle of uh, July, it's through raining. Here we are going toward the middle of August, and it's still raining. It's been very, very weird. We had a horrible winter, which we never have. I, I think I've worn my coat since we've moved here 12 years ago, maybe a half a dozen times, and just didn't need it. Sweaters are fine. And it, we got real winter, snow and, and like six, nine, ten inches. Uh, not prepared for that at all. We got a late summer, and normally we have many, many days of 100 plus, and we, I think we hit it maybe once or twice. So, I don't know if that's lucky or not lucky. It's just weird. <laughs> All right. Now, real quick, like, uh, Geraldine's last name was actually Bounce Palmer's a middle name or a maiden name. Maiden so name. I, Palmer maiden. Bounce. Right. With a hyphen. Bounce. Uh, I did not pronounce it correctly or say it correctly, and I want to correct myself and thank you for your help, Marcia. There's a, that, that, that's okay. Geraldine Palmer Bounce. Like Mouse Bounce, I always tell her that she laughs at me. Uh, she's my... Partner, um, I hate to even use the word co-host, but I guess that's the technical term for it. We're equal. This is our show was something that we worked on for a long time. We talked about it. We talked to other people, gathering information. We wanted the kind of show that people felt at home. And we do get that response. People tell us, our guests tell us, our people tell us. Uh, it was like being in your kitchen having coffee. That's what we were after. We're out to educate people on the paranormal. Geraldine is also an empath, a medium. She is amazing. Her talent is amazing. And I know I'm a little prejudiced, but it's the truth. She, <laughs> she truly is uh, something else. And so that helps our show a great deal because she understands the gifted. She does run classes. Um, mentoring and so forth for people who don't understand their gifts or they have children that don't understand them. So it's, Which you know. Which is also what her empath book is all about that we were going to talk about today. I, yes. I had a chance to read that this morning. <laughs> yeah, she, she actually has several out and just more or less trying to, you know, get out what she teaches. And for people that really don't have time for the classes, she doesn't charge for them. They're free online. But, um, you know, people are busy. People work or they got families, and not everybody can be there at that time. So uh, it works out well for people like that. And uh, we just, we really try to get the word out. We're trying to educate people on the paranormal. We're trying to show people that it doesn't have to be a cutthroat, ugly thing. We can support oh, each God, other. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, that's that's the main thing we were seeing that we hated, and it's like, what is up with this? We should yeah, I'd like to know be... why why does the paranormal, especially in the radio end of it, have to always be so highly competitive? It I mean, doesn't. is this about which yeah. show gets bigger, or is this about uh, working together as a team to get all the information out? Exactly. And that's what we're trying to show people. And you know, we are starting to see a bit of a difference. So I, I, I hope that what we do is accomplishing a little bit of a difference. Um, people are starting to share. Why wouldn't they? Isn't the whole idea to figure this all out? I tell you what, I got a couple, three hosts that I share with on a regular basis, like, uh, Micah Hanks and, uh, Jim Harold. Right. We do the same there, thing. There's other hosts that are out there that are like us that, that we'll share. Um, you know, you just got to ask. <laughs> exactly. You know, you don't want to be pushy or anything. <laughs> it's like, I'm here if you need me. That's awesome. So it, it's, we love it. We truly do. Uh, we're having a lot of fun. We have a couple of cute segments um, that we do. One is called Earth Angels, and people send us in their stories about everyday people that go out of their way above and beyond the call of duty, so to speak, uh, to help others. And they don't get any recognition for it, which is really shows their true intent. But I think they should. So we honor them on the show, and people have gotten a real kick out of that. They love it. So we're keeping it in. And uh, I also have one. We're a spiritual show, not religious, but spiritual but I do, I've had so many ask me, would you say a prayer for my aunt or say a prayer for my friend who has cancer? Or there's, I'm getting a lot of these, so we do that now. Uh, one prayer at the beginning of the show for, you know, whoever wrote me and needed it done, that's what I do. After that, it's all fun and games. We have a dance segment <laughs> where I make everybody stand up and get away from their computer and get out the cobwebs and wake You don't up. do it in the Old West method, so do you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, where you shoot at the feet and say, dance! <laughs> <laughs> I kind of do, and they know I mean it. So, so I'm up, I'm up, they're staying in the chair room. <laughs> I fuss at them, get going. And uh, luckily, I have my husband as producer because he does all the hard work, and Geraldine and I come in and be pretty. So that's all we have to do, really. <laughs> and sort of, yeah, you know, we read over our notes, of course, and try to. Well, I always want to know about my guest. Um, I never want them to feel like they were an afterthought because uh, they aren't. They're they are the show, and the people out there listening is the reason for the show. Well, my philosophy is if you don't have a guest, you don't have a show. If you don't have a listener, you don't have a show. Therefore, exactly. both are required. <laughs> you betcha. And unfortunately, you know, we've listened to shows where you could really tell it was all about them, and they were having fun. Well, I'm all for having fun. We have fun, too. But I never want the audience to forget that we're there for them. And if they have something they want me to say, if they have something they feel is important, um, I am accessible. Call me, write me, PM me. I don't care. I will try to get it done. Maybe not that week, but I'll get to it the next week. So we really want people to feel involved. And so your what show is, is it? weekly. It's every yeah every Wednesday night. Oh yeah, night. that's right. You did say that. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> no, that's okay. From seven to nine Central on Block Talk. Uh, if anybody does want to listen, they can get the link from my website, uh, Marsha Becker, and also Ed, uh, Edwin Becker. Um, Geraldine's is just Geraldine Palmer Baus. They can, um, a show friend them and they can get it. But we also have a website for the show, which is, uh, www.theparanormalangels.com and all information will be there. Now, did and you just say listen. blog talk? Block talk, yeah. Okay, well, before I go any further, first thing I want to let anybody that does happen to be listening live know that this show is interrupted. We got thunder going on outside, so Do you? Oh. where there's thunder, there's power failures, usually. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's keep our fingers crossed, okay? Yeah. We'll get through it before it does <laughs> that. The next thing I wanted to mention to you is I used to be a, a, one of the Blog Talk radio hosts over there. Did you? Yeah, Paranormal Palace Radio is still over there, but I don't... Um, 
I don't broadcast on it anymore. When they started charging forty a month, that was beyond my disability uh, paycheck would pay. Right. So I ended up posting on my own website. You, so you've got your own started, right? Right. That's awesome. I, I'm so not tech that it just sounds impossible to me. But I think that's awesome. <laughs> well, now, I recently was invited within the last six months to start going on an every Thursday slot over at Revolution Radio. Mm-hmm. And that one's been working out pretty good. I, I was trying to use it to get visibility for this show over here because this show here is uh, like 99% uh, archive listens and, you know, seldom ever live listens. And I was trying to you know, fill up my chat room and get some inner reaction going, in other words. That, I love that. Yeah, I I know that a friend of mine does her show on podcasts. I think, and in, in one way it's great because her and her husband have very busy schedules and they can do the show on their schedule and the guest schedule. So there is an upside to that. But she said they do miss the live audience. And I, I would miss my people. <laughs> we do. We have so much fun, and they're so kind. And well, that's why I want to fill up my chat room because uh, it's been my experience that the <laughs> listeners will throw in some interesting uh, comments and questions and and <laughs> points, and and they just make it that much more lively. They really do, and uh, we just, you know, they funny. I'll get some of the funniest statements, and I'll hear Ed in there just cracking up, and I'll be in the other room. Otherwise, we kind of, the phone does weird things if we're in the same room. It just makes me sound like I'm talking in a tin can or something. But, yeah, somebody will say something fun. And, uh, you know, I only have one rule, and that's to respect the, uh, the other people in the chat room and the guest. They're allowed to ask questions. I'll read them off. I have call-ins. But, don't you're call allowed, in with you're the allowed idea. to disagree, but don't come at, but don't call in attacking the person. <laughs> yeah, right. No attacking. And, you know, we agree to disagree. Fine. That's uh, you know, I wouldn't expect everyone to agree with everything every guest says. Of course not. I don't either. And I found out that the guests don't expect it either. Right. They don't. And I have found out that too. And they've been very gracious. Anytime anyone has said, well, I have a tr- I have trouble with that. They go, well, I understand. I have trouble with it too. <laughs> you know? So you'd be surprised. It's not, not a big, you know, not a big deal. But Ed and I have, you know, before we did this, Ed and I have been on many, and of course he's been a lot more than I have, but then they started asking if I could come along because I added a little more to the story. Uh, in his book, when you get through it, when you get through True Haunting, you will see that I've, we've had a lot of people say more. What's what's the conclusion? And I think we're talk, we're thinking about it uh, doing a second one because the book really is from his perspective and how he felt about everything going on. Um, there'll be some differences from mine just simply because I was there 24-7 and I had a little more experiences. Yeah, a little bit more experience as he did, yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, they they attacked him as being the alpha male. They attacked me as being the scaredy cat. So we got kind of different, you know, they they went in different directions with us. flip flopped right? your schedule. You might have fooled them a time or two. Oh, I don't know. These things, you know... I've had a lot of people say this. We we get a lot of mail and calls for people that are going through this and wanting a little moral support more than anything else, a little validation. We also have a lot of groups that we can recommend, um, people we can recommend. We try to get that out there, too, uh, because it's worldwide, so we can't reach everybody in person. And, you know, you can only do the best you can, but... I, we get it. Ed and I understand what these people are going through and it's awful. It's, it's isolating. I mean, you feel like you're the only one in the world. And if you say anything, people are going to lock you away. You know, the men in the white coats are going to come. I think it's better today because it's more accepted. Yeah. But back in 1970 and 71, if you went around telling people you had a haunted house, they probably would lock you away. And it just wasn't. And the people that did believe in it just didn't talk about it. So we were they actually... were afraid the, to talk about it. 
Yeah, well, we were actually the first um, Yeah, that, that's televised. the thing that Ed was telling me about was that yes. the, your haunted house was the first one that was ever televised, and it was televised on NBC. Exactly. And uh, it was done very, very professional. Uh, we were concerned. Because are they going to come in and make us look like idiots? <laughs> you know, because you can edit stuff and do funny stuff, and it won't come out the way you think it's coming out. We were nervous about that. because I don't know to hear Ed tell it in the very beginning of the book, and I don't mean no offense to him, but he was doing a pretty good job of that on his own uh, with his arrogance and not believing in ghosts at the time. As you bet. But he learned better later on. So I didn't mean that yes. the way it might have sounded. <laughs> Well, you know, that self-defense mechanism um, that kicked in, I don't think it's that he didn't believe it. He did, what he did was try to rationalize. Because if he could come up with a logical, rational answer, then it wouldn't be that. And anything but that, don't let it be that. Because I've got to go to work, and I've got to leave my wife in shelter every day. And how can I do that if I know it is that? That's interesting, it really is, because you know what I hear people say all the time? They're looking for answers, and mm-hmm. they never seem, and many of them never seem to find them. And until you just said what you did, it never dawned on me that they're 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 looking for their answers, not the answers. Exactly, you hit it right on the head. That's exactly correct, because every haunting is different. Everybody has different situations. Now, some people have family they can go to. Some people are fortunate enough to be in a economic position where they can pick it up and go rent some other place or whatever. But the majority of people are stuck. They don't have anywhere to go. They don't have enough money. Usually, like us, all their money is tied up in that house they just bought or rented. And they don't have a way out. So that's where it becomes scary. That's the worst of the haunting is that you are, you're tied. Invisible chains keep you at that location. You have no way to get out of it. So right there, when you get into that mindset where it's hopeless, that just magnifies everything. Everything becomes well. Yeah, there's a negative a, energy entity in there. Yes. It can feed on your negative energy. You got it. We did everything wrong, <laughs> but we <laughs> had no internet. We had, you know, the younger people have to understand. We do get letters and say, "Well, why didn't you record this or take pictures?" They have to understand. <laughs> we didn't have that. Equipment. It was a whole entirely different world. Different back. world, and there were no taking pictures. I mean, yes, we had an old camera, but it cost a fortune to take that stuff to the Photoshop and get it, get the film developed. We were broke. We were making it week to week. And the whole reason we loved that house so much in the first place was that we could rent out the second, the first floor and the rent would help us with the house payment. And by the way, you can thank Ed for me. Yeah. He made me, he made me feel old. Oh, <laughs> he made you feel old. <laughs> well, yeah, when he started talking about what had not been invented yet in the seventies, <laughs> and you know, I had never really stopped and thought about it. Yeah. I mean, I knew that we still had a black and white TV in the seventies, and that they were just coming out with color, but yeah. it, it still didn't connect till he started talking about fax machines and other, you know. Computer's not on the market yet. Oh, no, no. He's he's getting a list going, and I'm like, oh, my God. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's his second book, which is A Trip Back in Time. Uh, The the whole reason for that book, it's a cute story. It was started out as a bedtime story for the grandchildren, and it developed into a book. Everybody loved the concept of Um, going back in time with your grandchild. And to the time you were that age. So they go back to 1956. And it is an amazing story. It's, we we'll, we tell grandparents and parents to get it because it's a, it's for the whole family. It truly is. And you know what? The teenagers and the kids that have read it love it. And they love that idea that, you know, you can go back with grandpa to when he was 10 years old. It's amazing. 
And so he just, he brings up all the nostalgia, all the things that were there in those days. So we do get a lot of letters from people our age group and they go, oh, we love this. It made me feel so good because it took me back to that time. And I remembered, you know, when a hamburger was 12 cents. And <laughs> I remember you know. when a gallon of gas was a quarter. And my dad used to drive to his yes. competition's uh, locations at night just to read their pumps so that he can go down lower than them. Yep. <laughs> yep. Oh, I remember the first car I got. And it was, I believe, I think it was 22 cents a gallon uh, when I was 16. And... That, you know, our grandkids and our kids look at us like we're aliens. Are you kidding me? You know, but also they have to remember that minimum wage, I think, was a quarter. I don't remember what minimum wage was when I was a child, but I do remember that uh, a candy bar was a dime. Yes. A 16-ounce Coke was like a quarter. Like a quarter, yeah. Uh, And back then, kids could go and buy their parents cigarettes. Exactly. I did all the time for my parents. I did too, but then that, that stopped in the um, early 80s, I think it was, when kids were getting caught smoking. Sure, sure. That By the time my second one was born, they were very strict on that. And, and it just, you know, the world has changed very, very quickly. So have hauntings. Oh, yes. But you know what? I don't think that somebody said that to me. It seems like there's so many more hauntings. I don't really necessarily think that may or may not be true. I think the thing is people are talking about it. So, yeah, you're hearing more about it because people aren't so afraid to talk about it. Uh, they're a little braver. Well, there's that, but there's, I'm also, what I'm thinking about is back in the day, they did not have all the technology for ghost hunting that they oh, have out yes. today. Oh, yes, true. And couldn't get them. But you know where where I ran into a little trouble was um, we've had we've had investigators on. <clears throat> Usually, it's investigators that uh, have a very amazing story, or they've written a book also, or it's a multi thing. But we've had inv- and I my first one of my first questions to them is, do you take someone with you that is gifted? Most times they say no. Surprising. I always thought it would be a given. Well, of course. That way we know where they are, and it makes our job easier. I said, well, that, but then there's another side to that coin. Does anyone sit with the people? Does anyone say, we're going to fix this for you? And when they leave, uh, at least maybe they've started get the ball rolling and maybe it won't be so haunted by the time they're done or they can actually fix everything. Amazingly enough, the answer is no. We're just there to verify it. And so it leaves me a little surprised. I I, think a lot of them, they want to verify it because they put it up on their website, their radio show, their TV show to get attention, have content, uh, attract people. But in the end, they don't really care about the people they're going out to. And that's what worries me, because a lot of times you, in fact, I would venture to say probably most times, uh, they can go in there and set their machines up and get everything going. Then if you'll notice on TV or anywhere else, they'll start antagonizing, saying, come on, come on, you're such a big deal. Talk to me. Say something. Well, yeah, they're getting this thing really upset. So then they leave. Now these people now have a very kicked off ghost. <laughs> That's I think be... Ed wrote in his book True True Hunting that he made that mistake early into yes. the game. Yes. <laughs> and absolutely. The night before the NBC exorcism was even more frightening to us than the than the big exorcism. And it was real. They filmed it as it happened. No special effects, no nothing. It was just pure raw footage. Unfortunately, a lot of it was destroyed and lost. Three and a half hours. Yeah, three and a half hours of, I I just said, so down to, I think, 10 or 11 minutes. Now, on the the 6 o'clock news, which was only a half an hour, that was amazing that they gave us that much time. But they said they just could not cut it down anymore. 
it, to me, it, the amazing was, part was they didn't edit it. They did put um, mm. they they put there was a show called First Tuesday, similar to like sixty minutes and so forth. Uh, it was out of California, as we understood. It did not play in Chicago. So we didn't get to see it, but we heard about it. And then they used a ton of the footage because the show was an hour long, and the whole show apparently was about that. We have never been able to find. We've Googled it. We've done everything we can. The show is there, and some of the episodes are listed, but not ours. Hmm. So we haven't been able to get our hands on that much footage. We freaking somebody's got it somewhere, but we nobody's found it yet. <laughs> and believe me, people are looking. <laughs> they want it. They want to be the ones to say we found this footage, and it's just like it's awesome. But you know, the, uh, backtracking a little, the night before they asked us to leave, take the pets, take the children, everybody out of the house because they knew. There was at least two, especially one, very, very nasty entities, one being a demon, and there's no doubt about it, the other one just being a really bad guy. He was a bad guy in life and a bad guy in death. So they were going to try to eliminate that part because they didn't want any bad stuff to happen the day of the shooting because Joseph had said they've had that happen before where furniture was flying and stuff happened, people got hurt. So they've learned not to do that. They did. They were in there for hours, and we were sort of just sitting in our car waiting outside. We didn't have any money to go anywhere, so we were just kind of waiting. And I was getting nervous. I just felt something very uncomfortable. And then they waved us in from the window, so they were done. I'm telling you, the minute we walked in there, that air was so thick. it was You couldn't breathe. It was like all of a sudden not being able to get air in. They both looked so defeated, so tired, like they were drained. And Joseph looked at me, and I looked at him, and he shook his head. They were not successful. Well, about 4 o'clock in the morning, we get <laughs> get an early wake-up call. It was the worst most agonizing sound I have ever heard and it was like a human being being tortured and not even a human I don't know if a human could even make that noise and it seemed to come from everywhere I said you awake and I yeah are you I said who could sleep through this and he said where is it coming from I said I have no idea the living room the dining room he said well, maybe the, it feels like it's coming from everywhere and as soon as he very slowly, trying to be very sneaky, reached over and to push the button on the tape recorder so we could at least get the sound, they stopped. And so don't tell me they're not smart. They know what you're doing. They read your minds. They know what your fears are. They feed on that. And so their main thing is to isolate. And that's what happened. Uh, people, you know, our friends, they wouldn't come back over. So there went our weekly card parties, and, you know, all of us were young marrieds with a, with a baby or two, and nobody had money to go out, out. So this is what we did on the weekends. And our friends would come over, and we'd make scrambled eggs at 2 in the morning, and, <laughs> you know, we, and really enjoy ourselves. I know the kids today are probably saying, oh, my God, how boring. But we thought it was great, and we loved it. But after a few times, our friends stopped coming. Our family stopped coming. They wouldn't, even though some of them said they didn't believe in it, they, they said, well, we're not saying you're lying. We're just saying we don't believe in it. But they did. We found out later. It just scared them so badly, and it, it made them feel guilty leaving us there. But, you know, the rest of the family, they had their own families, and everybody, space was tight, money was tight. So, no, we couldn't go traipsing over there with a the newborn and all the stuff that goes with it and interfere with everybody's lives. We right. had to stay there and deal with this stuff. Unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, it's true. And, you know, I used to take... Um, 
I used to take Christine in her buggy, and they really were buggies in those days, <laughs> and old-fashioned prams, or I think they call them. And I would take her and go to the, down to the church, which was a couple of blocks away, and just sit on the steps because I needed to feel normal. I needed to see people walking around, doing what people do, being normal. I just need to know that the real world was still out there because I was beginning, starting to feel like the world I was in was all there was. And I was trapped. But so, again, like you said earlier, you were there 24-7. Yes. And you know about a few weeks into this, um, one of the sisters was going up the steps and she stopped. And I said, good morning, sister, and trying to be polite. Um, I'm not, you know, the steps were real, real big. It was a very, very old church and very wide. So, you know, people could easily sit there, which people did, and rested for a while until they went shopping. It was common to see people sitting on the steps. And she looked down and she said, you're not welcome here. I just, I, a part of me just died. I was speechless. I couldn't believe she And all of that, that because your house was on it? Yes, well, it had happened that a few weeks before, we had our daughter christened and had the priest come back, come back to um, bless the house, which was <clears throat> what they did. So we did. We had the christening, and our family was all, unlike in the in Paranormal Witness, <laughs> the whole family was there. Uh, it wasn't just us for a christening party. And the priest will come back, and, of course, you give a donation to the church. And so he went to raise his brass holy water dispenser up in the air to shake the bits of water out as he said his thing in Latin the holy water dispenser shattered now this is solid brass so impossible but it did it shattered and he's bending down frantically trying to pick up the pieces I guess they have to uh, once it's blessed once it's that they can't leave stuff behind I couldn't figure out what's he doing I said don't bother I'll clean up later father and he said no no I have to do this and I really didn't catch what was going on until afterward because I think I was in shock and what do you mean it burst into midair it shut not in flames just shattered the brass dispenser so he was so rattled there were two doors and in those days um, the thing to do was to wallpaper the insides of your doors and to match your walls and all this cute stuff, which we had done. But unless you had been there, both doors look identical. <laughs> he walked into the coat closet. <laughs> yeah, seriously. I mean, at the time, yeah, we all kind of giggled. Um, but if you had seen the look on this, his face when he walked uh, he was shook I'm leaving now and he opened the door and ran my husband's running after him like one of the marathon runners trying to hand him the envelope and the priest doesn't even care he just wants to, to leave so we found out much later on that that was not the first time the house tried to get blessed and not the first time there were problems so it people this young priest wasn't aware of the, the story of the home. So he, otherwise, he would have never come, agreed to come to the house. And we could not get him back to finish. And our tenants could not get him back to do their apartment. The church said no. They would not have anything to do with this house. You know, that gets me to thinking, though, A, are you guys still living in that house? Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. A little under two years. Okay. Um, again, I'm going to let Ed wait for him because it's a very unique story with a very, very unique twist. And the word angel will come into it. <laughs> okay. So, yes, we uh, did manage to find a way out of there. But, like I said, it, it was almost two years that we were stuck there. It felt like a lifetime. What I can't help but wonder 
is how Myra stayed there for as long as she did. And did it have anything to do with her going nuts? Oh, no question about it. She was probably at least oppressed, if not possessed. Uh, there's, she was wild. Her eyes were wild. Uh, she, you know, she would look at you, but it's like she's not seeing you. She looks past you, not at you. And I noticed that, and because I'm always aware of that, and I try to get into people's eyes. I like to look people in the eye when I talk to them, so it sort of bothers me. Like, hello, is there anybody in there? And she was the the weirdest, most bizarre person I'd ever met in my life. She would come upstairs screaming, running into my apartment. I never locked my doors. And she would come in screaming that I had moved this or broke that or, you know, it was always something ridiculous. And I said, Myra, I've never been in your apartment. I would never do that. It's your apartment. And I would never come in without your permission. So I would sort of be backing her out as I'm talking. And as soon as I got her out the door, I'd close it and lock it. Because she did scare me. Uh, she frightened me a lot. There was an instance where after she left, we put the place up for rent. And we were going to paint it and stuff. But Ed was in a hurry. So he put the ad in and sooner than I we were supposed to. So I had a call on it. Uh, it was a young couple, exactly our age. Our babies had been born in the same hospital. We had the same baby doctor, but we didn't know each other. But yet our lives were extremely parallel. Very, it was amazing. So her and I are talking, and all that was in there was an old kitchen table. <clears throat> I set my baby in her little bouncer on top so I could drape my arm around her and continue to rock her so she would stay asleep and I could talk to this woman. Out of the corner of my eye, she, her baby was in a walker. Now, her baby was very, very petite, very tiny, three months old, not old enough to be able to move a walker. She said, oh, she'll be safe in that because she, her legs don't even reach the floor. I said, okay, so I'm explaining to her that if they want to paint, we will pay for the materials and uh, take it off the rent and so forth. So she was excited. She loved the place and said yes, and uh, she'll bring her husband back that night. Out of the corner of my eye, I see something, and I look over. Now, the door, they had taken the door off that led to the basement. Why? I don't know why anybody would do that. But the door was down there in the basement. We just hadn't had a chance to put it on yet. Myra had just left like a day or two earlier. The baby, the the stroller, was on its way to the stairs. I took a running leap, grabbed the back of that thing in midair. It literally was off the steps. And I pulled back, baby and all. I was so petrified that I had hurt the baby's neck. The baby was fine. But I was a nervous wreck. I thought, my God, did I hurt this baby? But, you know, would have hurt it worse going down those steps. So it was, you know, just a decision I had to make. And it was just one of many, many things. I mean, this was the sort of thing they did with you to play with you, to make you feel insecure, to make you feel that they give you doubts. Anything negative, any negative emotion, any negative thoughts, that's what, that was what they did. And I think that's what wears on people. And if anybody, if you've ever talked to someone who has been in a, in a haunted home for any length of time, um, not all ghosts are out to harm you, but just the fact that they're there doesn't work well as it was explained to us that the two worlds are not meant to live together. So right there, there's friction. Even if it's your great-grandma, Amy, you know, and she's just there to visit, it's still not a good thing to have for any length of time. If you're, you know, if they've come to say hi, or we, I believe relatives do, and I think people always say they had a dream about their grandmother or their aunt or their mom or dad or whatever, I I do believe that when you need them, if you're having a time in your life where you need them, I think they come back and give you a little comfort, maybe a little advice, 
in a dream or whatever. Um, so that's, that part I don't have a problem with. What I have a problem with is people who say, I keep them here because I need them. Oh, that's not good. Not good. No. Very bad. One thing, and, you're on dependency already. For another thing, you're depending on something not of this world. <laughs> that's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's just, you know, I don't think people want to think badly of, if, especially if it's a family member or they believe it to be. You know, here's another thing. Uh, energies lie. So it may not be great grandma Amy. This may be something really nasty, but it's getting your, your confidence. It's getting your trust for a bit of time because it's going to hurt you eventually. But it's, it's gathering information on the best way to do that. So people don't understand that bringing those relatives back and forcing them to stay there for your needs is just the worst thing possible. So see, that's just a, one more little piece of information that a lot of people say, wow, I never thought of that. Of course, please do. <laughs> please, because if you don't, you're going to be scared eventually. Well, you know, um, there's been a lot of things happen through believing in sources not of this world. I mean, uh, Belita Vasky uh, had channeled information into her book, The uh, Secret Doctrine, and uh, Alice Bailey was another one that uh, I think had material out based on channel. But the thing is, when you're getting it from a channeled source, you don't know if it's a good source disguising it that is good or if it's a bad source disguising is good, and right. you have no means of telling. So if you're just yep. getting a message, are you getting a destructive message that you recognize as a good message, or, you know, <laughs> what are you getting? Exactly. And that, you know, that does, I'm with you on that, and so many are excited. Oh, I got, you know, they're saying this or they're saying that. We actually have a voice from beyond. <clears throat> I'm just sort of freezing Going, oh, There's more than one kind of idea? voice from behind is the problem. <laughs> yes, exactly. You just described exactly what you should not have done. I wouldn't be that happy about it because what have you done? Do you even know what you've done? <clears throat> and and sometimes those people leave the people there in worse shape. Things are in much worse condition than when they got there. So, again, we say, please beware, like buyer beware, please check out your investigators. Any good ones will have uh, recommendations, they will have something to back. Uh, are they a TAPS member? Because TAPS is very picky, and they really scrutinize their members, so it's, that's always a good thing. Um, we have a website that we recommend which is uh, paranormalsociety.com, societies, plural, dot com. This wonderful man has, Bill Wilkins, has taken years of his life, um, and he's gathered up all the different uh, groups and people and gifted, depending on what your needs are. You can go to his website and then by zip code, put your zip code in, and it will give you a list of whatever is near you. And then you can take it on and call and find out, yes, is this group for me or whatever. Now, a lot of times the groups may say, no, we're not what you want, but here's a number for who will help you. So at least we're getting people on the track of trying to find help. And it's, I mean, it's not like you can put an ad in the paper. You know, I have a ghost. Somebody want to help? You know, it just doesn't work well that way. And unfortunately, you have what I call do-gooders, whose their hearts in their, are in the right place. They truly want to help people, but they just are clueless on how to do that. A lot of that's uh, due to a lack of education. I, I mean, I've met people in my life that uh, they can study one chapter in a book on a topic and all of a sudden, they're the world's greatest expert on it, and they yep. go out and try to help without any further education. The worst thing is the demonologist. Now, every now it's popular to be a demonologist. You can go online, and for $55, you can get a certificate that says you are now a demonologist. No, 
<laughs> Absolutely, positively don't. And if that's their only credibility, don't do it. Because they mean well. I know they do. They think in their hearts that, that they've taken a two-hour class and they can go and really get these demons and send them back to hell from whence they came. Odds are absolutely not. You're going to make it worse. And you probably just opened up the door for a few more to walk in. So be very, very, very careful about that. Make sure you get some credibility. You know, it would be awesome if every single church offered an exorcist, but they don't. We haven't quite come that far. I'm not 100% sure the churches really know what they're doing. <laughs> exactly. You know, that's, our, that's why I say we're, we're not a religious show. We're a spiritual one. And we believe that whatever your belief system is, Whatever makes you feel like you're contributing, whatever makes you feel good about yourself, that's fine. And yeah, and we are more on the spiritual side. Not we don't care what you are, what you aren't. Uh, could care less. And if you've got something to offer, if there's some help, if there's something we don't know about, and believe me, there's lots we don't know. <laughs> right. We haven't heard yet. So we're we're loving it too because we're right along with the audience going wow I never thought of that that's really something to think about because every haunting is different it's like snowflakes they're all different and every entity like people are different so you don't know so therefore you can't go in there knowing everything I don't care how hard you try or how much you learn because each thing is new. That's right. And, you know, there's also a thing about where sometimes it's the land. Yeah, I've heard uh, about that before. Yeah. Like a house is built on uh, uh, war plots where Indians were killed or cavalry men were killed or Civil whatever the war, case may be. Sure. Mm -hmm. And it's not just that. It can be um, it can be a family thing. And way, 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 way back in your ancestors, uh, somebody messed around with, you know, witchcraft or dark magic or whatever, and that's all it took. Now, from that minute on, they wanted every soul in that family to join them. And, let's, you know, come, look what we've done. We're now the new family, and they're going to come join us. That was how I started to feel. Everybody asked me, how, because I bought this house without me along. I know that sounds very strange. But I was pregnant, very pregnant, and having a little bit of trouble. Um, so I was kind of feet up and not allowed to really get out there too much. And in those days, a woman's signature meant nothing anyway, even if she worked. The lone people did not, they don't care. As long as you're within baby making age, they don't consider you any kind of help, so they don't consider it. So it really didn't matter. It wasn't like, which house do we want? It was like any house we can get because we're broke. We don't have any money, and we're, we're, we don't even know how we're going to do this. But one thing Ed and I do have, we're very strong on his faith, and somehow we just knew that it'll happen. Of course, we didn't have a clue it was going to happen like this, but it, you know, we knew something would, would come up and we'd manage it. So my answer to them is when I walked up those dark stairs and they were very, very steep, um, light in that place got absorbed. It just didn't ever get light in there at all. It just, there's, somebody told me there's a name for that and I, should have wrote it down because I always forget. Um, I felt like I was walking into someone else's home uninvited. I felt like I shouldn't be here. This is somebody's house, not my house. Why, what am I doing here? But it was my house. And I had to keep telling myself that. Within a year of living there, it switched. It, it came from get out, get out. Believe me, they said it many times. Myra said it many times. Get out. This is not your house. Get out. We heard that constantly. Uh, it went from that to you're not going anywhere. <laughs> they switched their story. Yep. 
and uh, we got your soul right here. No, you don't. <laughs> you know, I would say it out loud. You know, no, you don't. God has my soul. You can't have it. But, and I'm very stubborn. Yeah, you know, put my foot down. And I think, I hope, I really do believe in my heart that helped. And, and I, I don't know what they would have done if they had looked at my head and saw that I had given up all hope. Who knows? I never quite reached that point. I still had faith that God would help us find a way out of here, and he did. So I'll let Ed, because that story in itself is a whole story, so well, I, won't, I won't spoil it. But it, did, you, did you and Ed ever uh, get a history of the house and who, who lived it and died there? Not really, because the people, the original people that we what little was left of the family that we bought the house it was an estate sale. Uh, they were the, the only owners. We were the second people. So, uh-huh. yeah, and, and I, you know, uh, it's 1980 or I think it's 89 or 87, something like that. I should, oh, I forget these little details. But um, the house was, you know, almost 100 years old. When we bought it, uh, the wow. neighborhood was like that kind of neighborhood. Families stayed in their homes. And when the parents aged, they moved into the back bedroom and the kids took over the house. And it just kept, you know, going that way. Rarely did people sell their homes. This was just the way it was done in those days. Well, Ed and I, not really having that much family, we had to start doing it the hard way. <laughs> And it was the hard way. It, it, when I hear the kids today complain, I shake my head that you have no idea. You just have no idea what hard work is or how hard it is just to scrape together. A, you know, we thought we would be in heaven if we could put $25 a month away. And, you know, kids today think like, what? I spend that on a DVD, you know, <laughs> no big deal, but it was a big deal back then. I mean, groceries. I remember my budget was twenty dollars, and that was my including baby food and. You could actually so, eat on that back then. Oh yeah, you betcha. And we ate well. I mean, nobody starved. I, you know, it was fine. Uh, we had a store. I can't remember. It's Hilo, I think it was called, and canned goods, vegetables, and soups. Anything that came in a can vegetables, uh, anything, fruit, uh, was 10 cents a can. So, yeah, <laughs> you know, snacks like potato chips and stuff like that was 25, 35 cents a bag. So you could make $20 stretch pretty far. And then I was always excited if I had a couple of dollars left over so I could add that. And what we would do is when there's enough, we would actually go out to eat. Go to McDonald's. Going to McDonald's was a big deal. <laughs> so, oh, we get to go to McDonald's tonight. I know the kids today think, you know, oh, that's just crazy. But no, it was a privilege. Yeah, that's right. We go to Wings and more. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, we have that here too. I love it. Yes. <laughs> but it's, if you really do just kind of shrug your shoulders. And it, it's been a little difficult. We've the younger generation reads this book. They don't quite get um, us being that helpless. They, like they said, why didn't you just take pictures or why didn't you set up cameras? And and I'm looking at them like because they didn't exist. <laughs> and been like, why did, don't you walk a mile in our shoes? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, the only people had stuff like that was NBC and CBS and all those places. We didn't have that kind of equipment. And there was no such thing as your neighborhood ghostbuster. We were so, so lucky. Ed, he loves to tell this story. I was like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? He finally you know, said, okay, I get it. We've got a problem. And I said, Ed, we can't live like this. What are we going to do? And he flippantly, but see, I'm a very naive person. I took him seriously. And he flippantly says, Look in the yellow pages, because that used to be a commercial on TV, that if you need anything, look in the yellow pages. I didn't catch on, so I took him, (laughs) and I got out the phone book and went down the yellow pages. Believe it or not, there were two groups under psychics. 
and I called the first group in. They were ridiculous. In fact, they're, they're saying, okay, your house is now clean. We've been through it with salt. We did all this stuff. And they're standing in the doorway. And as they were doing that and said, your house is now free, it's clean, the telephone comes flying off the table, slams down to the floor, and they couldn't get down those stairs fast enough. I thought they were going to break their necks. <laughs> so, yeah. So I called the second number, which was Illinois Psychic Research Center, and they were the real deal. They were doing serious research, and they had Joseph Delaware's as the head. And they said to me, well, look, we're, you know, we're, we're booked, like, for months. I don't know when Joseph, or if he'll get back to you, but we'll do the best we can. I hung up in tears. That was my last resort. That's all I had, and there's nothing more. That was it. So I gave in to it. For the first time, I think in a long time, I gave in to the hopelessness. And the phone rang just maybe five minutes. It was him. And he said, I will be there tonight. He said he got such a strong vision of what was going on. It scared him to death. He said, I have to get over there and help these people. They're in danger. And he showed up, and they, believe me, they check out everything. They check out your record. They look in your eyes, you know, are you dilated, are you doing drugs? No, we were the cleanest people on earth. We're just trying to survive. Um, they wanted to see if there were train tracks near there, uh, underground water ways, you know, that used to be there, and they're not there anymore, things like that. <clears throat> so they, um, yeah, they checked out everything. They talked to the neighbors, finding out, you know, what kind of people are they? Do they have loud parties? Are they good people? Well, no, we were never at loud parties. We were in bed by 9 o'clock, you know. We were old at 22. So, <laughs> and you just, you know, you had to survive. So, yeah, we were checked out, and that actually made me feel better. At first, I was a little offended. Then I thought, no, that's what I would want to know. If I were reading a story or seeing something, I'd want to know that it was on the up and up and these people are telling the truth as they know it. And fortunately, Joseph saw so much in his visions and he got stronger and more. He became a dear family friend for many years. We keep in contact. How you guys doing? It was... It affected everyone. We contacted um, some, one of the reporters. Okay, I'm not sure I'm allowed to say her name, so I don't know if I will. Um, she is now a big deal reporter out of, um, out of. oh, God, was she out of now? I think Wyoming, or, or and she also does Washington. So she's a big thing. We contacted her because she had a book out. We wanted... At the same time, we did. We wanted her uh, signature, and she wanted ours, as it turns out. And she said, I will never forget that. I will never forget it. And that was 40-some-odd years. And so it's, it's just something that if you could, and even the little bit they went through in the three and a half hours they were there, she said, I got a taste of what you must have to live with. Stuff that came on the sound tape, the sound man was ready to bolt. He wanted out of there. And he was hearing stuff that we weren't picking up on. We did, we heard it later when they played it back. Knockings, there was a child's voice that was saying, Mommy, there was all kinds of very, very bizarre, scary things. And this is way before the complicated equipment of today. Yeah. So it was very, very clear. Uh, the birds, you know, that were all over the place. <laughs> I... But, you know, it, it kind of got us going, I think. We didn't talk about it for many, many, many years, not even to each other. Because I think my fear anyway, my personal fear was if I talk about it, they'll find me. I was so petrified they'd find me. And... That case, not knowing. Not think about it either. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we just didn't not do it. 
Now, when Ed started writing, which he did really as therapy after his heart attack, um, he just, it was the way he could get his creative juices going. So that was, he had already started what he lovingly called a diary. And which was, so the facts were fresh and he would remember things. So that's why there's so much good detail because he did keep all this information um, that he put down with, you know, ongoing through the years. He'd write more and more, add it to the pile, and then eventually decided to do the book. Now, his other books are what he likes to call um, novelized truths because he takes what's going on today in people's homes and, and everywhere, the stuff that's going on today, and then he tells a story about it. And it's amazing. I mean, Banished has a demon in it that will <laughs> knock your socks off. The research we put into that to make sure we kept it as true to form as we could uh, was many, 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 many hours. The same with Death List and with Famished. We did our research. We talked to people. Uh, what, what's going on? Famished is about the drug world and what could happen. And you know, the thing is, before we got the book, book in print, it was about uh, meth that went wrong. Somebody made the wrong ingredients and turned them into zombie-like creatures. And the... The, uh, the frightening thing was just maybe two weeks before the book came out, there was an instance in Florida, I believe it was, where a homeless man was on the corner with a sign asking for food, money, and a guy jumped out of his car and started eating him. There was another instance at a college had the same thing happen. College roommates started attacking and trying to eat the guy that was there. We were like, oh, this is just too scary. Sounds I like mean, zombies <laughs> to me. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is like, oh, okay, did we make this happen? Oh, geez. No. <laughs> but, it, you know, life, you know, when they say that nothing is stranger than truth, that's real. You can't possibly make stuff up that's scarier than today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the, the horrible thing horrible thing that is it is too much going on too much sad stuff so now now we're kind of round about went back to the why we're doing the show but it's that same kind of thing i like hearing people like you say that that you that's your thing too you're trying to get out information you're trying to support other hosts and other things you can all help each other and i just think that's great i hope everybody subscribes to that eventually so do i but in the meantime i need to subscribe to supporting my son john he's got a uh match right at uh, about five o'clock this evening and he needs uh well he does the mma fighting he's got a uh, muay thai fight going on tonight and he needs to wash his uh clothes to go to that and go to work afterwards so i don't Aww. want the washer going in the background because when they misload it it goes knock 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 and dances that's okay i get it i know that <laughs> it was so nice talking to you thank you so much for letting me substitute oh no problem matter of fact i'll be glad to have you back anytime you want to come back fine just give us a call you ever get stuck again i'm usually home <laughs> so that's sad, isn't it? But I'm usually home, so. <laughs> you might fill in for Ed if he's missing when I call him. <laughs> yeah, never know. That's right. And, you know, sometimes what Jody and I both, we make each other, we're a great team. I'm so, so lucky to have a partner like her on the show because we just kind of read each other's minds and it just clicks. It's just one of those things. So I am very lucky that way. It's doubtful I'll ever be able to attend your show, though, or you mind, because we're both on Wednesday night. Oh, I can do that. <laughs> Actually, though, I am thinking about discontinuing my Wednesday night show and placing it, replacing it with my Thursday afternoon show. Oh, that would be a good, that's a good time. Thursday's a good time. We were kind of thinking about doing that, too, but nobody had a Wednesday night show, so that's why we chose Wednesdays. And we're really trying not to... You know, we don't want to bump too many people, but we have really good friends, and their show does overlap 
it starts an hour later than ours, but the, our second hour is their first hour. And um, I still promote them. I don't care. Hey, if they got a better guest than I do, go listen to them. I want you to. So it's that kind of thing. It doesn't have to be. You know, oh, yeah. When I was over at PTR, or or the other talk. host would pop into my chat room during my show and say, <laughs> I, I'm going live here in about 30 minutes if you're interested. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so. We get that, too. And I, isn't that nice? Makes you feel good. At least it lets people know you're not out there just competing and trying to be uno numero, in other words. Exactly. Exactly. But I do thank you so much. It was a pleasure filling in. I enjoy it. And as you notice, there's no shortage of things to talk about. So. <laughs> well, that is true. I could, I could keep you going all day myself. Uh, especially <laughs> if you start talking about ancient aliens and, uh, you know, the, uh, ancient Oh, mysteries. that can get you going too. Let me tell you. You're going <laughs> to get ready because, uh, He's had quite a bit of experience. He's interviewed some very interesting people that uh, I'm hoping some of them would like to give for my show. But, yeah, it's, um, I tell you, there's, keep an open mind. That's my motto because I'm never going to say nay until they prove it to me that it's impossible because I think everything is possible. So let's go check it out. Sounds like a winner to me. Yep. I'd like to thank you listeners for listening in. Couldn't have a show without you. Want to thank you for joining me today, Marsha, and uh, tell Geraldine that contact me. We'll get her rescheduled for October, early November, somewhere in there. Okay. Thank you very much, and God bless. You too now. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Come see me when, uh, this coming Wednesday. I don't have my schedule open right now, but I, I will have a show this Wednesday. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.